Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tiffany Harrison, and as Veronica mentioned, I'm a program specialist with the Doctoral Scholars Program here at the Southern Regional Education Board. Last month, we introduced you to our versioning partnership with Liberty Mutual Insurance Company and had the opportunity to host a dynamic webinar on evaluating personal career wellness. Um, the recording to that webinar is posted on our website, and we definitely like to encourage you to take a listen to it if you haven't had the chance to do so. Today, we're going to continue that partnership with Liberty Mutual, and I'd like to introduce you all to Ben Thompson, the Senior Director for Data Science in Liberty Mutual's Data Science Division. Ben received his master's in econometrics from Washington State University and his bachelor of science in actuarial mathematics from Central Washington University. Ben has been at Liberty Mutual for the past 13 years, and he manages a mix of data scientists, analysts, and machine learning operation engineers. And we thought that this might be uh, great for, for some of our current scholars. At Liberty, he helps to build and deploy models to help distribute insurance products. Ben enjoys spending time with his wife and children and enjoys windsurfing and snowboarding, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, today, Ben is going to chat with us about how to explain research involving complex ideas so that it makes sense to an audience full of experts in the field and to non-technical audiences. So Ben, thank you for being here with us today, and I will leave it to you to get started. Well, thank you for having me. I didn't realize... Uh... I'm the second Liberty Mutual employee to come talk to all of you. So um, big shoes to fill, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I'll go through, uh, I have a, a presentation prepared. I, I've done it for um, other groups. Um, it does tend to have, a, it is a data science example that I go through. Um, but feel free to interrupt me, have the open dialogue throughout. And at the end, I'll talk about um, uh, Another thing I do uh, besides uh, my normal job at Liberty Mutual is uh, I uh, I manage the data science internship program for um, graduate school students. And I'll talk a little bit about that and how to apply if that is interesting to you. If you don't know if this audience is interested in um, data science, but I always feel uh, like I need to plug it. So I will. Um, okay, so bear with me. It's uh. I am relatively new to Zoom. We use Teams, but I think I did this well. You did. Good. I can still see all of you. That's good. <laughs> that, that is a positive. So, um, uh, okay, so everyone can see my screen. Um, so communicating complex ideas to non-technical audiences. Um, Thank you for the introduction. I feel like I don't have to go through the slide, um, but this is me windsurfing and snowboarding in my family. I enjoy all those things. Um, so a little about the agenda. Can, are people seeing their, their moves? Good. Um, so the importance of understanding your business problem. Um, you should know uh, your diagnostics are important to the business problem. Um, I'll talk about explaining the expected economic impacts of your model or whatever uh, technical thing you're building uh, to a broad audience, and then questions you should be prepared to answer. And I tried to take, so I, I take this presentation to um, our, our internship uh, program every year. So these are master students and data er, and PhD students in technical fields like um, computer science, math, statistics, um, uh, some behavioral sciences um, to kind of talk through like problems I had when I was a, a grad. So I was, I'm a PhD dropout, uh, but I, I uh, um, towards the, the end or the middle of my, my PhD program, I had to spend a lot of time at least communicating my research and presenting it. And I was felt like I was a little rocky at doing that. And then when I went into industry, I realized I was really rocky at doing that. So just trying to hopefully help folks out with, it could have just been me too, right? Like, um, you know, I do feel like some of these soft skills are, are learned over time and you have to work on them. So 
hopefully, uh, for those of you uh, who find this helpful, self-awareness, I think, can help these things. So I will stop rambling on and, and jump into the slide. So understanding the business problem. So like, oh, sorry. Um, if you don't spend time understanding the problem, how can you validate that you're building the right solution? So oftentimes, at least in industry, I'm not sure about academia, you'll have a leader um, ask you to build an AI solution for something. And you can go down a path and try to build it, but if you don't understand the real problem, that your leader is trying to solve, you likely won't build the right solution. So I'm a big proponent of asking questions up front. So what's the size of the opportunity? So if you're if your leader or stakeholder or maybe your your research professor um, you know asks you um, to work on a particular uh, you know problem or opportunity, but doesn't understand the general size of it, I, I think that that's worth digging into. And at least a takeaway is assessing what the potential size of the opportunity is. Because um, if it's small, there's probably not no point of, you know, jumping into it. You know, are, is there a customer pain points we are solving? Um, you know, oftentimes um, when you're thinking through a problem, if you don't think through what the customer is, is likely going to Experience, it can be a real negative experience for the customer and actually maybe hurt sales. Um, how do we define success? So in general, like being able to have a measurable outcome is beneficial um, and defining what those key measurements I think are very important. Um, how will it benefit? How will we benefit from this and how? Like, um, like so I'll go through an example later. But these are just general questions to ask. Um, how do we discover the opportunity? Um, like in general, I, I like things where people can articulate uh, why we're doing it. Maybe we have a high call volume from customers who think this is a really bad experience or we're seeing drop in sales in this segment. Like. It, I like to have a narrative because <laughs> it helps build my narrative when I build a solution. Um, and then have we ever tried something like this in the past is always great. Like, especially in academia, I'm sure you do this a lot, right? You're, you're trying to understand what research has happened in the past to inform the research you'll be doing in the future. Um, whether you're accrediting that research or just trying to understand it to form new research, it's important. Um, and then, this is really big in my industry, but does compliance need to be involved? Um, I think that's even a broader discussion nowadays. Like even if there isn't laws against something, especially when you're talking artificial intelligence, it's important to kind of think through, you know, is what we're building really appropriate for the masses? Um, there's a whole, um, new concentration of study called trusted artificial intelligence. And that's making sure you're not causing undue biasness through your modeling work. And just so, just throwing it out there, these, that was a, a recent ad I've added to this presentation because I, it's, um, you'll see, it's not countrywide, but state by state, um, states are taking action. Um, so important to think through that stuff. Um, and then things to think through outside of questions you'd ask is, is there data available to address the opportunity? Like, can I test the data? Like, I know, sorry, this is very much a data science heavy presentation, but oftentimes um, the data early on in my career, I would just trust the data was accurate and I've learned to assume the data is not accurate. So <laughs> I am a big proponent of, of validating observations before going through a full on process of building a solution. Because oftentimes the first part of a project is cleaning the data or ensuring you're getting the right data, especially if you're predicting something that could impact a customer. Um, no, no one wants to be, uh, I guess, have some solution that people think are tailored for them that is not. Um, and then what kind of problem am I solving and what tool should I try to solve it with? 
Um, I won't go into this part at, at this time, but like, it's a, what type of mock, really just determining like what kind of statistical tools I should use to solve this problem are important to think through. Um, and then how can I implement a solution? Um, this is like a huge hurdle in our industry. Not when I say our industry, I mean like in the quantitative field industry, we have a lot of people who are very technical and can build technical model solutions, but implementing that model so it impacts the customer appropriately is often thought of last when it should be thought of first. Um, so I think those are things to think through. And I think this is tied to communicating um, complex ideas to non-technical audiences because oftentimes the work that'll come to you is coming from a non-technical group. And these are the questions and things to think through before you go down a path of building something that will eventually be presented back to that audience. Um, so any questions on that? Okay. Don't be shy is what I'm saying um, when you're picking up a project like this or research. I have a uh, question, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned on the last slide about um, making sure the last that the solution is catered towards like the audience or the I guess whoever the, the customer I guess mm -hmm. um, when are these data science projects are they usually done as a team or is it usually like an isolated project like an independent um, it's a really good question if you were asking that question five years ago I'd say it was probably isolated but it's um it's a team effort now like um there's a lot of controls in place like peer review um, before kind of like if you're doing any type of research in academia, you know, you have your null hypothesis and the hypothesis you're testing and what the, the KP and how to actually def reject the null. Mm -hmm. Um, so it should go through, um, a very scientific process like that before it hits production. Now, where I see things kind of fall through the cracks is on that right-hand side when they're not thinking through the data or how the data is collected. Because you know, if you were to peer review my model and just trust that the data is correct, you might come to the same conclusion. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to kind of really think about how um, the information is collected before kind of going into that next step would is what causes, I think, the bulk of the problems when building and deploying a model for a certain audience. That's where you get it wrong. That's where I've seen it the most. I feel like I've been doing this long thank enough to, to mess up enough <laughs> to, to know. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I like to go through an example use case of a project the steps I'd go through and then in the end, I'll, I'll show it like a slide I would actually show to an executive. Um, or if I were to take it to like a road show or a broad audience of maybe like sales employees, how I would describe it. But um, example use case, you know, you're in the marketing department and you're trying to predict what type of customer we should show ads on social media sites to. Today we run ads on the traffic during a campaign and we pay per ad we display. So unintelligently, we're just paying per ad. Um, currently, 5% of our ads get clicked, which, you know, leads to new business. Uh, so the business opportunity, and this is something that something like this would come to my team. Uh, by correctly displaying the right ads to the right people, you know, we can reduce our spend and increase sales. So you think about the world, how it used to be, you know, a, a lot of these um, marketing approaches would be broad. You'd cast a wide net and really were kind of artificial intelligence data science comes in is really like, how can you more effectively spend that money and get more growth? Um, so our current campaign costs $4 million and generates $10 million of revenue. So the campaign's already working, right? Like, but how can we make it better is the business problem. Um, target variables categorical, which just means did they click on an ad or did they not click on an ad? That's all I'm trying to predict. Um, we have historical data on customers who have clicked and who have not clicked on ads. 
And there are many features or variables that you can include in a potential model. And we can deploy a model with these social media websites and collect data on model results. All those extra bullets are just to let you know that I satisfied the prior slide where I said, hey, these are all the things you should think through. <laughs> Picture I thought through those things. Um, so we, we've now established we have good data. You know, We're able to implement a model. We know what the business problem is, and we know what kind of model we're building. We're building a categorical model, just predicting one of two outcomes. Um, so from there, like, um, you create the model that you're able to predict on that, that website. So things to consider are false positives. Do false positives cost us money because we pay per ad presentment? So like, when, whenever you're thinking through implementing something like this, um, people like to talk about accuracy or precision, but I think it's also to think through, are we causing harm when we predict something incorrectly? Um, in this case, we just lose money. We're already, when you're, the prior implementation had the same problem, but sometimes, you know, with your research or if you're, you're working for a particular company and trying to implement something very technical like this, oftentimes people don't think through the harm they can cause with the wrong prediction. It could, and that harm can sometimes outweigh the benefit. In this case, it's just money. Like we'll, we'll lose money on the wrong predictions. Um, with no model today, we have a 5% click rate. So we know the baseline we need to beat. We need to get a higher than a 5% click rate or reduce our expenses and maintain a 5% click rate. Um, we show an ad on all customer traffic when we run the campaign. That's what we're currently doing today. So some key diagnostics I would need to think through. Um, and the reason I, I'm kind of going through this is that I always have my team understand the technical diagnostics. And then we try to change the wording. Like I would use the word precision if I was presenting in a data science form. But if I were to be talking to executives, I'd say, uh, be talking about how often the model displays an ad on the social media site and we get a click. That's all precision means, right? You need to convert the terminology into something an executive would understand or a broad audience would understand, which is basically, this is just how often they're clicking on us when our model runs. Um, accuracy is how often the model displays an ad on the social media site and gets clicked on and how good the model is at not generating an ad and not uh, and an ad not being clicked on. So like accuracy might not matter as much for us because we don't really care how good we are at predicting not to take an action. And then recall is just how often we present an ad to a customer. It's just the magnitude. So after evaluating it, uh, you'd realize um, after weighing the business impacts of the model results, we decide to set the precision at 10% which means they would click on us 10% of the time, which has an associated recall of 50%. Um, basically what we're saying is, is we should be displaying ads on half the traffic and getting double the clicks. That's what a model could do. Um, and if I were to explain this, this is the optimal point for our business case because less precision will increase recall uh, too much. And then, uh, the revenue we would get would not outweigh the expenses. Uh, but if we increase position a little bit, recall drops significantly and the extra expense wouldn't make sense. So really that 10% precision point um, is where you'd want to set the model. That was a lot of words. That's not how I'd present it to executives. This is, all that would just go into a slide that would look like this. <laughs> so you do a bunch of work, you satisfy all those, um, those questions, the things you think through, you build your model, you go through all these diagnostics and you really only need to show one slide that kind of condenses all that information. And in the title, you should uh, just explain what needs to be communicated to the broad audience. So model can save the company $2 million a campaign. That's what all those metrics boiled down to that I went through. Um, and then real quickly, we recommend implementing a model to intelligently display ads on social media websites. 
The model can generate more sales if needed, but we recommend setting our threshold display ads on half our customers because this maximizes profit and minimizes our expenses. And I always like to do a two by two that shows what's happening currently and what a model would do. And then I always circle the two variables that matter the most, right? And that's our estimated cost of running. This campaign is now cut in half, but we're still producing the same amount of revenue. And I always put this on the side. Wouldn't actually have this to a broad audience, but it says, keep it simple for a broad audience. Because the end of the day, um, whether you're talking to a large group of people, let's say like you're at like a symposium, there's a lot of different articles being shared. It's really hard to retain all that information if you're consuming multiple papers in a day. Same thing with an executive or a broad group um, within a large company. They're consuming many PowerPoints a day and they just need to understand like, why should we do this thing? Um, and then at the end, I always like to just mention post-launch will be able to monitor expenses and click rates associated with the model so people know there's a monitoring strategy. Um, so that was a lot. Um, Basically, you know, if you were to summarize it, there's a lot that goes into these projects, a lot of questions, a lot of things to think through right away. It gets real technical in the weeds when you're actually developing your solution. But when it's time to actually show folks, you know, who probably don't have your technical expertise, um, less is more. And communicate the benefit, not necessarily like, you know, we went through all these different diagnostic strategies. We decided between accuracy or precision. We tried a regression model versus, you know, a categorical model. Like, they, you're the expert. They'll trust that you went through those steps. Um, now, granted, if you're talking to a tactical audience, include all those things because, right, that's more of like a peer presentation and you're either maybe trying to help your um, whatever your field's community is, um, or internally you're trying to do um, some type of knowledge sharing, but for communicating to the broad audience that is not technical, just play the hits. <laughs> um, any questions on that? Never try to say more than one point on a slide when you're communicating your work. I always think that's important. And then um, I think you should be prepared to answer these questions, especially in a mixed audience. Be able to communicate at a high level the outcome of a compliance review if one was completed. Um, we talked about this briefly um, in the beginning. Um, in MySpace, trusted AI is a really big deal. So like, you sure should be thinking through that type of stuff before um, you know, building a solution and showing it to executives. Like that's table stakes. Um, have a monitoring plan. Like we did all this research, we want to do this thing. How do I ensure folks that if we go forward with this, that, you know, we have the right controls in place? Um, how you plan on implementing your solution? Um, so uh, for, for my job, a lot of my stuff runs in real time in different systems. So I uh, need to kind of do that technology work ahead of time. And this is always the thing that people forget. And it has bitten me in the past, so I will never forget this, is will there Im be impacts to our core operations? Like we're a large company. Um, we got 50 to 60,000 employees globally. A lot of them are using our internal systems daily. I wanna make sure I don't do anything to negatively impact a customer that might increase their workload or do anything that would hurt their ability to do their jobs. Um, so those are, um, important things to think through. Um, and I'm sure the same thing with, uh, any academic paper, if you're suggesting some type of change, there'll be positive impacts and there could potentially be negative impacts. And those are things I'm sure you would think through in your papers. Um, so just, that's more of like, a keep it simple, but actually be able to have a lot of depth in being able to answer questions. Um, so that's what I have for talking to broad audiences. I, I do have an extra segment that um, highlights our data science internship program for graduate school students. I'll, I'll talk about that briefly, but wanted to take this time now to 
field any questions you you may have or poke holes into whatever I said or um, you know I'm happy to to answer your questions. So Ben, thank you for pre presenting this information. I'm you know as I was listening to um, to what you were saying, um, a couple of key things you know kind of came out to me that you know I think could be transferable between you know both our academic folks and and data science and our, we've got plenty of statisticians and, and STEM folks in our in our program. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that you said was to remember that you are you're the expert. You are the one who knows this data inside and out and um, not just for um, data science for insurance purposes, but also when you are um, presenting your work, you are the scholar and you are the one who is the expert um, about the the research that you're you're presenting. So I, I definitely appreciate you um, highlighting that as a, a key point. That's a good point. I don't touch on this at all, but um, when I first became went into management, I had to go through lots of trainings and I read a lot of books and there's a lot of like, um, and I think this applies for everyone, whether you're in management or not, um, like posturing is and like, basically there's all these uh, ways you can trick your mind into having a high level of confidence uh, by taking like a power pose or standing up before. But um, the reality is, is, I mean, you are where you are because you've, you are the expert or you're very knowledgeable and you're learning and you're not going to get everything right, but you likely have more information most than most of the people that you're talking to. So you should feel empowered and confident when you're speaking. And I'd say um, if, if people do have um, struggle with that, especially when talking with very broad audiences, there are lots of ways to um, that are, I won't quote them because I don't have anything to cite, but I'm sure you could do a simple Google search. Um, ways of tricking your mind into having like a, kind of the more um, confident speech. I know I struggled with that early on in my career, being super technical. And I always felt like a huge weight on me when I would present to leadership. And I think I had a squeaky voice and I didn't come off super strong and I was lucky enough to have some good mentors that I think just inflated my confidence maybe more than it needed to. But uh, <laughs> that's probably part of this. And maybe I should include it in this presentation, but you are the expert. Like, yeah. That's tell people how it is. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions that I have kind of along those lines is um, you talked in your presentation that, you know, after you, um, have done all this data work and after you put together your super simple slide that, you know, has basically the bottom line, um, you said you talked about being prepared to answer questions. And so I'm wondering if you would suggest um, like being in contact with, you know, either customers or research um uh, participants about, you know, some of those questions that needed to be asked ahead of time. So you're not kind of blindsided. Like what's your, what's your experience in, in being able to answer those after the fact questions? Yeah. In, in industry, how I do it is um, I have a network of folks I meet with either weekly, biweekly or monthly across the organization. And I leverage that network to review my research before I would take it super public to get feedback. And, and what I described on the, the prior slide is the bulk of the feedback I've gotten historically. Mm -hmm. But if you can know, if you, if you have a connection within um, kind of the audience you're presenting to, their feedback's probably more valuable than anyone else's. Um, like if you're presenting a research paper at, like I said, a forum, obviously your research advisor, or I don't know if you have like a mentor professor, that's probably the network I would leverage because they've probably done this a million times. Um, and, and in fact, in graduate school, I leaned heavily on my research advisor a lot for those kind of things. And uh, 
Although in my experience in academia, they don't necessarily uh, sugarcoat it. <laughs> like I felt like you're pretty torn down every once in a while, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily build confidence before presenting. So maybe things have changed, but uh, hopefully it's a little more, um, I guess, energizing than what I got. But I had a really yeah. great research for research assistant for a research professor, by the way. I nice. really enjoyed working with him. But yeah, he would he just didn't really have a filter. <laughs> um, um, so. one of the one of the questions that I got in the chat is, can you elaborate a little bit more on? um translating the impact of your research like that was i i picked up on that too is that you know you've got this this really simple slide that you know goes back and says you know man this is it but you know what are some suggestions that you have if you know i say i'm a student or you know i'm working in an organization and i've been knee deep in the weeds forever trying to get some research how do you pull yourself up to say, okay, what well, what matters to this audience? How do how do you translate that that impact? I guess so. That's a really good point. I guess this example is mostly focused on industry. So you're talking to people who have profit and loss responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, I used to work as a um, as a research con research analyst consultant for Nielsen TV ratings. I think that was mentioned. Um, and we'd have um, customers. Uh, a lot of them were marketing customers, and a lot of what what I would provide leading leading into maybe something like this, especially if the results were like not great, would be customer testimonials, sort of like um, uh, from like the research of like that were positive. Um. I think that's so it's I might not be answering this question well because I think I've been in industry too long mm -hmm. I think I do think of things in terms of dollars and cents just been where I've been aligned to sales right but I have seen a lot of people talk about like um uh net promoter scores and their slides are a little more like warm and fuzzy I'd say where they they might have snippets of positive customer feedback or maybe they would have snippets of negative customer feedback which would lead into why we need to do this thing to make customers mm -hmm. happier mm -hmm. um it's all part of telling a story um this is very much a story of why we should be converting like our um marketing dollar strategy to be leveraging data science whereas um other groups would would probably have more of a, a story that would connect the more human aspect of what a project would be and, and mm -hmm. what that, and, and those honestly always play well, like, um, and they're, they're very valid because there's, there's tons of studies that show like brand perception and, um, customer sentiment leads to growth. Right. Um, so that's how they, they've conveyed them in the past. Not Honestly, good. I should probably do more of that in my, <laughs> in my, <laughs> gotcha. my, uh, I said, been sitting, sitting in the data science org a little too long. I probably need to go out in the field a little more and interact with, with customers and people and then come back and my slides might look a little different. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, I, I won't take up any more question time. I'll let you okay. talk about, um, the internship opportunities. Yeah, so this is just a, a plug for the internship program at Liberty Mutual. So um, I got these from HR, by the way. <laughs> so nice. a little bit about me, I should say. So I volunteer part of my time. I um, I am part of the interview process for getting an internship at Liberty Mutual. Um, I won't necessarily be your interviewer if you go through it, but you have like a 50% chance that it's me. Um, so myself and someone else split it. Um, but uh, it's my first time actually presenting the program. So let me know if I do a poor job. Um, so at Liberty Mutual, we are a community of over 200 data scientists. Um, I'm one of them. Um, and so we do uh, provide an environment focused on community and culture, uh, career development, making an impact. The data science community 
really is a community at Liberty Mutual. I'll be flying to Boston next week to be part of the Data Science Forum. All 200 plus of us are going to get together, share our research, get to know each other. The data science community thrives, I think, best when you have this community because um, we're all building on each other's research. It's, it's basically a research arm. Um, and it's not like a disparate function where you're like uh, building widgets. Um, so I do think from my experience, it has been the most communal experience I've had here in the various roles. Um, so how the summer internship works is 10 to 12 weeks. Assignments are based in Boston uh, or remote. I will say I am in Seattle. So I, I've had interns come to the Seattle office. We also have a Plano office. We have an office in New Hampshire and we have an office in Columbus, Ohio. So I know the slide says Boston, but, or remote, which is true. But, you know, if you're in any of those areas and you want to go into the office, you absolutely could. Um, so interns are matched to projects, which I do. <laughs> I am the matcher of projects to interns uh, for the business needs. Um, you'll gain exposure to our corporate environment, products, services. I mean, you're an employee for 12 weeks. So you'll um, be exposed to the whole um, company. You usually have a project that you, you do for that 12 months. Um, could be research, could be building a model. Um, you know, it, it, the, the spectrum is wide. Um, but at the end, you present your, your stuff to a bunch of leaders. So I'll be one of the leaders listening in. And then um, from there, I, just, I don't want to step on it, but um, we, we then have a certain amount of spots. We'll, we're, we're looking to hire eventually from this pool. So some cohort of those people will be made offers, some will be made offers to come back because a master's or PhD journey is multiple years. Um, so master's students, um, if they're converted as a, a job, convert into a data science analyst one. PhDs convert into um, an analyst two of data science or can go into a return internship. Uh, and we like to plug some of our alums we have a senior director who was there uh, and a bunch of um, other uh, directors. So um, while the program hasn't been long for, around for that long, um, I feel like um, going through it, we get really, you know, we're trying to expand our talent pipeline, but just getting in and getting that internship and then getting that position, you know, there's a lot of upward mobility. So big company. Um, and then how it works, um, lmi.co backslash graduate is how you get to the website. And then there's the job ID if you're interested in uh, applying for an internship. Um, this was the shameless plug I said I would do. Um, uh, from there, HR will look at your resume. Uh, there'll be a phone screening. And then if you get an interview, um, this is where I, I get involved on in that third step, <laughs> the virtual interviews. Um, I'm a behavioral interviewer, um, but there's also um, a coding component to it as well. Um, I will not be that interviewer. Um, and then offers will be sent out. Um, there's also, I, I should say, um, I believe if you go to LMI. We have my information too, you can reach out. We also have a mentorship program too for an outreach. If you're looking, if you're interested in industry or just gaining a mentor, there's um, a lot of people like myself that participate in that and will, um, like I'm currently mentoring um, a student um, at Utah State uh, who's getting his PhD in statistics. So uh, yeah, that that's my, um, my spiel. <laughs> uh, any questions? Um, I hope this was helpful and at the very least uh, you can look me up in LinkedIn and uh, if you're looking to build your network or if you're interested in um, just advice or just need the talk, I'm happy to do so. And yeah, best of luck with your, uh, your research and uh, the rest of your academic journey.
Ben, this has been really cool. And I do want to um, say to our scholars that are here um, with us live and, and to those that will um, come back and listen to the recording a bit later, um, many of you know that we also partner with um, a lot of different programs, um, a, a lot of different scholar programs. And so you'll meet some of these other scholars at the Institute on Teaching and Mentoring um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and so uh, part of the way that we were able to start building this relationship with Liberty Mutual is um, with a um, Sloan Scholar graduate um, who actually graduated and participated in the graduation ceremony um, last last year at the Institute. And, you know, he reached out to us and was like, hey, you know, this is a really great opportunity. I know um, not all of us go into academia. Um, most of our scholars do, but there are a lot of them that don't. And for the ones that don't, there are a lot of really great opportunities available. And he mentioned that, you know, with him working at Liberty Mutual, he was like, this is the best thing since sliced bread. So, I mean, I can't vouch for that because I don't work for Liberty <laughs> Mutual, but I will just say <laughs> that you do have a, a scholar partner who says that, you know, it's it's a good thing. So I do want to um, encourage any of you who are interested in in the um, the Liberty Mutual internships and and the mentoring to definitely reach out to Ben. Um, and I th I think um, that I can speak for at least all of us at SREB to say that this would be a, a wonderful opportunity to um, again get our our scholars more into the into the corporate space. I really appreciate you inviting me, and it was nice meeting all of you. Wonderful. And that's the block. Yeah. All right. Well, thank block you has so nothing much, to do with Ben. It. It'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> so, Great. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ben. We really appreciate your time. And we will see the rest of you in Tampa in a couple of weeks.